After the war, if the wives and children of servicemen and the control commission in Germany were to be allowed to join them, then the education of their children would have to be considered. And so the British Families Education Service was set up. The arrangements for primary education would be fairly straightforward. But the main problem would be the older children. And it was decided that boarding schools would be the only answer. Thus, Prince Rupert's school in Wilhelmshaven was born. It is believed to have been the first co-educational boarding school under the terms of the 1944 Education Act. The school was to cater for the older children of personnel serving in Germany, all ranks, grades and classes. Cast your mind back a few years when Wilhelmshaven was the centre of Hitler's naval ambitions. Smitherman, the first headmaster in his diary, noted at the time, I first saw my school buildings in February 1947. They were tucked away in one corner of Willemshaven and were overlooking the great harbour dug out between the wars. The site was a barracks completed in about 1942. The British Navy was in occupation, shortly to be moved to a smaller barracks. Our site was known as HMS Royal Rupert. My main recollection of the bunker was it was more or less our focal point. If we wanted to, to meet up with anybody or anything, or if anything took place, it always took place in front of the bunker. None of us knew what went on inside the bunker, and I've never been inside myself. What about your, um, where you were billeted when you went on to the main site? Uh, the billets. Well, for us, for, and for me in particular, it was like a five-star hotel compared to what we've been used to living in. Usually in a hammock, in the middle of nowhere, some old half-rotten Nissan hut with ice, icicles hanging from the ceiling and straw palliasses and, and concrete floors. Uh, when we went there, s s central heating, proper beds, everything else. The only thing that wasn't too clever was the food, but it never was in those days. Most of these billets in that time would have been used by the U-boat crews, so they got the best of everything, didn't they? Yeah. Because there were actually, there were four, four floors if you include the basement. Yeah. And when we used it as a school, we used to, you know, sort of have all sorts of um, oh. well, theory thoughts we didn't about go, the basement. We didn't go exploring. Yeah, well, okay. We, we, the only time we explored anything mm. was when we had to blow it up. What we didn't blow up, the Russians had in war reparations. And, yeah. and at that t time we hadn't got a clue about the Cold War, yeah. but we were told not to get too friendly with the Russian officers. So you, you actually came in by the guardhouse, which was just down from the pump work. Yeah, we used to nip through the pump work into Howl Block, that for, yeah. your, for your benefit, the next one down was and Drake, the, yeah. and then Rodney, and then you had Nelson. Yeah, well, mo most of these most of these were used for, for storage. Yes, because there weren't that many sailors there. No, think. no, they were, they were used for storage and equipment, you know, uh, and uh, that was Nelson, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, Nelson, Nelson was the, the dining hall and the administration right. block and the uh, the naval officer in charge, or in command of Willems Harbour, that's where it is uh, a court. The following month, after my first viewing of HMS Royal Rupert, the decision was made to take the barracks over, and Royal Engineers were called in to help with the adaptations that were needed with a view to the school opening in the summer term. Prince Rupert had been part English, part German, 
and both soldier and sailor. What more suitable name could be found for a school that was to cater for the sons and daughters of personnel serving in Germany? We were horrified on arriving in Willemshaven because it was the whole place was devastated, except for a few army barracks. Later we learned that there were whole families living there, one family per room. Um, so when we got over the bridge and found the school buildings were all standing, that was quite a relief. Uh, we had seen devastating devastation in England with our own bombing and on the journey through, through the Ruhr, which horrified us, and Willem's heart in itself looked the same. But the school buildings were there looking a bit forlorn and wanting a lot of attention. But um, workmen were everywhere. We had to report to Mr. Smitherman. Uh, the, the Colonel, he was referred to, he was still in the army then. Of was he actually in uniform? Did he, yes. He was still wearing was still army, army uniform. Army uniform. He, he yes. left the next day to, be, to go wherever he should have been mm. to be demobbed. Oh, right. Mm. So uh, he was quite a formidable character. There were men, workmen everywhere, yes. a couple of hundred workmen. Mm -hmm. Were uh, these naval, British naval people? Or were no, they, no, they were all local German people. They were local people. German mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Yes, all Germans, uh, local people, uh, taken on by the admin officer, uh, getting the, everyone ready, all the buildings ready, mm -hmm. because they were grubby, they looked awful. Mm -hmm. uh, some alterations had to be done to the buildings inside. They had to be cleared out of a lot of rubbish that the Navy had left uh, and all decorated, all had to be decorated. Every workman who worked for the school was given a midday meal and they used to bring their jerry cans and they took that meal home. They didn't eat it themselves, they took it home for their families because they were very short of everything, the Germans were. So they were very willing, I don't know whether they liked us particularly, but they were very willing to come and work for the school. And pleased to have a job. Because of this midday mm. meal, mid-shift meal they called Did it. Did they? And mm. uh, they all took it home, then none of them sat and ate it at all. Mm. They had a proper cooked meal, cooked in the kitchens for them. A ceremonial handing over of the buildings by the Royal Navy had been planned with the lowering of the white ensign and the raising of the Union Jack as a symbol of the change taking place. Some of the children had arrived on the 1st of July. Some got lost on the way and didn't arrive until the next day. But by 10 a.m. on the 2nd of July, the children were all there, dressed in a variety of unsuitable clothes and all looking older for their age, particularly the girls. It was evident that many did not relish the idea of coming to school. There were 70 pupils in that first intake. Guinea, guinea pigs, we called them because there were guinea pigs. We were trying out, and so were they. They came by train, and the train came in at the back of the school. There was one big gate opening onto the railway line. They arrived. We were as excited as they were, because we'd been very busy helping the matrons make up the beds, because the bedding only arrived, I think, the day before. So we had all the beds ready, all the rooms were ready for them. Great excitement as they piled out of the train uh, into two houses. We used two buildings only, the one opposite Churchill House and the one next door, Drake. So they were put into those two houses. The houses that were late in Howe and Drake, are you talking Howe about? And Drake. Howe and Drake. Yes. That's yes. just to get the bearings of because yes. they, the buildings did change names. They changed but names that's where the several first times. Two were. Yes. Mm -hmm. They were always Howe and Drake to us. <laughs> Boys upstairs, girls downstairs. No, the other way around to begin with, girls upstairs. Boys downstairs. They changed it, did but they? we changed them after the first term. They were all older children because I think they felt the older ones ought to get into school as quickly as possible. Because some of them had been out in Germany, I think, for some months without schooling, or just going to the local primary English school. So they were all, I think, over 15, or 15, 16, 17, somewhere almost 18. Mm -hmm. So then they had to start attending class. Yes, we had. Uh, Smithman had everything was highly organised by then. 
So the children had arrived, and obviously lessons were rather important, so they were then going on to do to their classrooms. And can you remember what facilities there we were? Had classrooms were the Nissen buildings at the side of Howe House. Um, and we had classroom lessons in the morning, and because it was summer, and I think very wisely Mr Smitherman decided this, we would all do activities in the afternoons and have lessons again in the evening, followed again by evening prep. So it was a very full day for children. But of course, we had them for 24 hours a day. And it's very sensible to keep children occupied if you want to keep them out of mischief. So their day was fully uh, booked. Um, with their classrooms and their activities, and the activities were manifold, really. There was, uh, we, one thing we had plenty of was sports equipment. Where did that come from? Is that uh, the, from the UK? Mainly, the army, the uh, army supplied, I believe the army supplied most of the sports mm -hmm. equipment, and that was there spot on. We were desperately short of textbooks. Um, equipment for the classrooms, science equipment, short of everything because not all that stuff had arrived. So it was very much chalk and talk in the classroom in those days. Probably not the first term, but certainly by the second term we had to have lights on in the evenings. So um, light bulbs were precious to anybody in Germany, so we had to look after our light bulbs. Um, they were usually put in no, we kept them ourselves. We put them in at the beginning of the lesson. At the end of the lesson, uh, each teacher was responsible for collecting the light bulbs. You usually got the tallest boy in the class to stand on a desk and take the light bulbs out. And we took them away with us for the next day. Quite Otherwise, <laughs> we'd have lost them. The first pupil to arrive mm -hmm. in the school in July 1947. And the basis of that was that I think we'd been told on the joining instruction to arrive between a particular time, say two and five. This was the opening of the school? Absolutely, yeah. the first six days. Anyhow, we arrived, and my father being a man of enormous precision about everything he did and does, we arrived on the dot, drove into the school, um, drove about, couldn't find anyone. Eventually the head appeared and said, mm, you, know, you are rather prompt sort of thing, you know, we'd arrived on the dot, uh, I think you're the first to arrive. And then as a, and so we unloaded our stuff at Drake House and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then as a, and he walked along with us, and I think we probably met Tom Duxbury or someone like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, and as a rider, he said, oh, by the way, someone else did arrive before you, and I don't know who, because they didn't stay because they arrived so early. I mean, someone had arrived right. exceptionally early, uh -huh. before the allotted time. And he said, now, I can actually almost remember, he said, they've gone off into the town somewhere to see if they can get some lunch or if I, and that presumably was you? It could have been. We, we came um, fairly early, and the first thing I remember is going into Drake House and seeing some great paw marks of Henry mm. up the stairs. Who's Henry? It was the dog. Oh, right. Sir, Sir, uh, Sir Bernard. Bernard. Oh, oh God. Massive, yes. Huge, Huge paws. Yes. <laughs> yes. Looked like a lion. Wonderful. Um, your father was actually in the CCG, and yes. I understand that you lived fairly close by to the school. Yes, we did. Uh, we lived in Oldenburg, which I imagine was uh, about 30, 40 miles away. Um, so, as a consequence, whether we read the instructions or not, I don't know. We arrived extremely early um, and were told to go away and come back at the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. So, well, we, we toppled off to a place called the Starboard Light, which I now understand from speaking to one of the teachers was the uh, Siemens Club, you know, it had been taken over, it was a German hostelry which had been taken over and they served wonderful cakes and coffee. Right, so the, the person who arrived really early was most likely you rather than... Um... I, I would think that the time we arrived was so early that nobody else could have possibly been there. Well, of course, we'd come by car, you see. Mm -hmm. um, what were your very first memories of the school? Only the fact that uh, I was in a, in a small room which had uh, what looked like uh, utility furniture, but I had a room to myself, as I believe we all did at that time, uh, double glazing and central heating, which was fine as far as I was concerned. So it was quite comfortable. Yes. 
Have you had any other memories of the more social side of the school? Well, yes. Uh, I spent rather too much of my time in the uh, communal uh, common room, which was on the top floor, as far as I recall, at the front. Uh, sort of overlooking Churchill. Yes, it, yes, Powell, yes, Powell yes. Powell yes it, it, it overlooked Churchill mm -hmm. House, and it was above the, uh, the the teachers' accommodation in the in the you know the housemaster. Oh, you see, the next term, the next lot of pupils came. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. So Another full train load the next time. Full train. Full train load. Mm -hmm. Yes. Boys and Other girls, boys, all ages. Oh yes, boys and girls, all ages, and, and all shapes, sizes, all different. Apart from all over Germany, were they from the British zone of Germany, of course. Mm. So, what what were the houses at that point then? Were you then expanding into using more of the buildings? Yes, we used the other houses. Drake and Howe were already going. The middle one, Nelson, was the dining room for the children. What about the where Rodney? Then became. Oh, sorry, I've missed Rodney. Oh, right. Yes. Okay. I Rodney wondered maybe if that was the later yes. addition, but yes, Rodney that, became Rodney at that point that as point. well. Yes. And then uh, Nelson was the middle one, and then it was Collingwood and Matthews. And uh, only one floor of Matthews was used for children because um, a number of the staff were in the lower floor, the ground floor of Matthews, and also it was our mess, the teacher's mess. The, the school itself proper opened in the September. Mm -hmm, yes. Now, how did you arrive at the school? Well, by car again. again. Uh, and in consequence, I was there early enough to be able to welcome the train as it came onto the site. The railway lines ran all the way along the, uh, uh, by, the, by the waterfront there, and uh, the train came puffing in. I believe it was after dark, but uh, the first thing I heard amongst the noise of a rabble was a commanding voice on the train trying to organise the uh, detrainment or whatever it was called in those, in those days. Uh, and this voice turned out to be the chap who eventually became the head boy, John Grosvenor. And very good at it he was. Um, behind you there, you have a hanging, a brown duffel coat. Now, I would imagine this is, bears some significance to your time at Prince Rupert's School. Am I correct? You are correct, because when I first arrived there, uh, it was still warm. But during the first term when the majority had arrived, it became extremely cold, because it was the winter of 47, 48, and it was cold. And Fortunately for some of the chaps, their fathers had provided them with duffel coats. Now, all I had was an unlined three-quarter length jacket, which looked as if it was warm, but the wind blew straight through it. I can remember standing on the edge of the football pitch, absolutely freezing. So what I did, we had a, a leave during the, ne you know, the, the, the next break. We came over to England. I went to Woolwich Market to a, an ex-government uh, uh, disposal shop and I bought that duffel coat for five pounds and I took it back with me and then I was warm as well. And we've, we've had a picture in our memorabilia collection mm -hmm. of a, a young man standing by the flag. Now I know I had no idea who this young man was but actually there is a story attached to this which you, you know about. Well yes I know because I was that young man. It was something I fancied having. That was uh, a shot of me with the Union Jack flying above my head. So I set it up and somebody else took it with probably somebody else's camera. But I set up the shot. But I really had no idea who the person was who actually clicked the shutter. It's, it has no significance whatsoever except I fancied it. So the school proper started with the, in the same influx time. of that. Yes, about 250 Next pupils yes. then. Mm -hmm. um, and for a little while the Nissen huts were used as classrooms, Still classrooms. and I understand yes. they then mm -hmm. began to build proper yes. brick built mm -hmm. buildings. Can you remember those being built? Because oh, not many people can. <laughs> oh, you can oh remember. I can indeed, yes. Because <laughs> we were in, lived in Drake House, near to where the building was going on. And in Willemshaven, it's really reclaimed land, that 
part. And of course the water uh, level is not far below the ground. So they have to pi drive piles in and all buildings have to be built on piles, concrete piles that are made, I don't know how, um, a good way down. And this pile driving went on day and night. And the noise was dreadful. We couldn't sleep. Uh, we complained about it. Nothing happened. This still went on the pile driving because they had a, a deadline for having the new buildings ready. So in the end, we went to the headmaster and said, the, la the women teachers, not the men, they didn't seem to mind. They seemed to be able to sleep through. But the women teachers went to the head and said, we're going on strike if we can't get some sleep. So he called off the pile driving from, I think, midnight till six o'clock in the morning. So we were able to sleep. So that made a difference. I wonder if the pupils were sleeping through it. They probably they were. Probably they did. probably did. I, mean, I don't think they complained. Right. The official opening of the school took place over a year after the first influx yes. of yes. pupils in 1948. Um, so, what can you remember about well, that? that? was a big day. Uh, it sort of happened in Churchill House, of course, and uh, Mr. George, the Right Honourable, I think he's called, Mr. George Tomlinson, MP, uh, Minister of Education, came from London. So it was quite a, a big do. Um, a lot of the Navy people came as well as visitors. Were the town officers? Town people? I think well? there would be someone from the mm. town, but I don't remember. Mm. Everybody, um, children all in uniform, staff all dressed up, I think. Mr. Smitherman had a big party afterwards for all the official guests. I think Mr. Tomlinson was quite impressed. He walked around uh, the site. It, didn't, it wasn't very long. Uh, the whole proceedings didn't last more than an hour, I don't think. Because right, it was quite a day. Mm. Yes. We felt we were officially opened then. Yes. <laughs> Willemshaven, the town um, of Willemshaven was a naval base. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of naval connections. Um, you, you mentioned earlier about the, the devastation there. Um, and life for the Germans was really Very hard, hard indeed for them. Yes. Mm. I remember the, the cleaners used to wait uh, at the end of school, outside my room, because I taught needlework, to pick up little bits of cotton that had been dropped or the odd pin. They were precious really? to them. Mm. Were um, they, were they, um, had they left any sort of remnants of naval? Oh, yes. Before the children arrived, we found a bust of Hitler uh, in one of the cellars. Really? We found a few oddments in the cellars. We found a little coffee table, which we eventually took home with us to England, but the bust of Hitler caused a lot of fun, of course. Um, we dumped him off, I'm afraid, in his own submarine base. The German shops. Now, Willemshaven today is a lovely town, the beautiful shops. Yes. What, um, was, what was it like There was then? nothing to buy, there was nothing in the shops. Everything was rationed for the Germans, and um, there was no point in us going around the shops because there were there was practically nothing to buy at all, so we didn't go around to the shops much at all, until the currency reform. I think that would be about 18 months or two years after we were there. And overnight, the shops were stocked with goods. But the Germans couldn't buy them because they hadn't any money. They only had a very limited amount of new currency. They couldn't draw their savings in new currency all at once. They could only draw them bit by bit. And they, they only had their wages, which were not very good. But we had money. We could uh, get uh, marks and we could buy from the shops. So we were very welcome in all the shops. And we spent a lot. The staff spent lots and bought lots of things in the shops. I bought all my china that I have at home now and all my silver bought it all in the shops in uh, Willemshaven. Was Karstadt Karstadt there opened, in those days? Yes, about halfway through my time. Karstadt so early opened. 50s. Yes, and I then was able to order material for needlework department. Of course. 
Yes. And the first order I put in, I went to see them and they said they would deliver it, of course, it was an order. Uh, and it arrived with a beautiful bouquet for me, for, for giving them the order. I understand that Churchill, was, that Churchill House was built for the Navy, our Navy, after the war. Yes. Now that then became um, an important building mm -hmm. where um, assemblies were held, but also church services, because in those days there wasn't a church. No, church was um, built after we left. Mm -hmm. Everything took place in Churchill. It was the centre of our lives, Churchill. We were there every morning for assemblies. Everything else went... PE, gym, there was no gym at that time. Um, all kinds of activities went on. We had films, we had concerts, we had dances. Saturday evening entertainments, every Saturday. Each house took it in turn to entertain the school. So Churchill House was the centre of our lives, really. It was our social centre. Right, and then of course on a Sunday there were church services. Church services held there. Sort of general uh, C of E service. Uh, the Catholics had a separate service earlier, and we had C of E communion was held earlier in one of the classrooms. But when it came to ordinary church service, I think at eleven o'clock, I think it was, we used to scout round the. Um, dormitories and say, church, everybody out for church, and they all came, Catholics and Protestants, everybody. <laughs> and you had confirmation. The confirmation, there, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. And the needlework department made the veils for the confirmees. Um, right. What, for each, each, each um, time. time? Each and time. were they reused? They were put away year? and kept for the they next were. time. Mm, they weren't given to that's, the pupils now. Yeah, that's kept. interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I understand there were a few recordings made of some of the services at there the school. There were. One Sunday there was a recording made, yes. I think in the first year that we were there, there was a recording made. Live. That was a live Was it? Recording. Straight through. Was that Christmas time? Straight through. Or, the Christmas or... carol service was recorded, but that wasn't live. That was uh, sent out on Christmas Day, I believe, over British Forces yes. Network. Mm -hmm. We used to listen to British Forces Network and in my needlework room, if the girls worked hard, I said they could have it on, the radio on for the last half hour of the lesson. So we did. You must have been a lovely teacher. <laughs> well, they, they, um, they'd work hard if I yeah. made them work hard, Encouraged set them some little treat afterwards. Mm. And to my surprise one day, I got mention on the BFN, um, the sewing machine, the sewing machine was the song they all sang. <laughs> and in, this was, um, um, the children had sent this in to BFM, unknown to me, of course. <laughs> Much to my surprise yeah. when it came over the air. <laughs> Did you have the treadle machines there? Yes, then? they were all treadles, yes. which the children found very difficult to work, of course. Yes. That, that's they? where I learned to use Did the it? treadle machine. Yes. I just wondered how early on they'd been there. Right, so uh, quite early on we got yes. the treadle machine. We didn't have them the first term, we had them, I think, the second term. Sports plaques in town, was that open right from the start? Oh, right from the very start, yes. With the swimming pool? Because the Navy had used it. It had been the German sport plaques, the German Navy, I think, sport plaques. The British Navy had taken it over. We took it over, lock, stock and barrel. The riding school, the swimming pool, all the fields, cricket uh, fields. Um, and we went there every afternoon. Groups went there every afternoon. Saturdays we all went by buses. Um, and in, when the weather was good, the lorries followed us later with our tea. And we had tea there. Oh, well, picnics. Picnics, yes, on Saturdays. And I think on Saturdays it was optional what you did. You had to go there, but it was optional. You could go and play tennis, or though you could play tennis at school, of course. Um, and thinking, talking of tennis and school, uh, Mr. Smitherman, during the hot summer, the tennis courts at school were covered in, in red shale and they got dusty because it was always windy in Willemsharden. So the headmaster decreed that the tennis courts had to be hosed down during morning time so that they were not dusty for playing tennis. 
and one day we had very heavy rain and there were the Germans hosing down the tennis courts. The conversation about Willemsholm wouldn't be complete without a mention of the weather. You've mentioned the wind. <laughs> what about the freezing sea which we hear stories about? It did freeze. It did actually freeze. It did actually yes. freeze. Um, summer 47 was the hottest summer I think I can ever remember and the following winter was the coldest winter I've ever known. Uh, the sea froze and we actually tried to walk on the frozen waves but you can't walk on frozen waves they're too spanky and too difficult it's impossible i think what sort of height were these waves just little um ripply waves oh, quite big quite mm. big yes but they were near the shore they were smaller of yeah. course near the edge but we did try to walk on them it was, was impossible yes was that actually but in the inner sea in the band to say, or was that actually over the other side over of the dike? Over the other side of the dike. So we really, up, right out into the, the sea. North Sea. Yes, it was the sea. It was the first time, the only time I've ever seen the sea frozen. Miss Fallows, you stayed at the school for six years. You've talked of some wonderful memories. And why do you think the school was so special? It was very, very special. It was, you know, the first absolutely comprehensive co-ed um, state boarding school. Now we didn't know the word comprehensive in those days, we soon got used to that in later years, but it really was comprehensive because we took in all abilities, age 11 to 18, all abilities. They came from all levels of society really. We didn't know the children's parents' ranks. We None of us knew that. We had their parents' addresses, of course, and phone numbers in case we needed them, but we never thought about that at all. The children were all equal, really equal, state-aided school, and we all got on so well together because it was a boarding school. They were there all the time. It really was very, very special. And somehow, um, a feeling of camaraderie grew up between children and uh, staff. And we all got on very happily together. Of there were moments when children were in trouble, but never had any serious things happen, I don't think. Tony Griffiths, you were one of the first pupils at the school in 1947. Um, why were you chosen to go to the school? Well, I think that um, my parents were told that we had to go to school. I don't think they selected. Uh, my sister went there as a guinea pig for the three or four weeks, and I went for the full term in uh, September. Right, and can, what can you remember when you arrived at the school? When I arrived, well, I can remember that the train actually went into the school ground. Right inside? Right into the school ground. Uh, then my sister had sort of uh, told me, get to the room first to pick the best bed. So I got to Drake House and there was, um, I met John Newton. Uh, that first term, the juniors were given two in a room. And I was sharing with John Newton and in the other room was uh, Alec Little and Larry Barber. And I can remember that Duxbury must have had a sense of humour because on their door was written a little barber. Okay. Um, teachers, you've mentioned Mr. Duxbury, but he was housemaster. He was housemaster, right. Drake, yes. Yeah. Um, were there other teachers who influenced you at that well, stage? Well, uh, the headmaster Smitherman, and the one who respected him greatly. Uh, Duxbury, yes, he was a very fair, fair man. And later on, I think it might have been when I was about 16, we had a teacher who was only with us about a term or two called Strickland. And I think he was the first person that had a good talk to me outside my family about um, growing up. Sea cadets, I, I understand it was compulsory for the chaps to belong to that. Well, um, was this an enjoyable well, experience? Well, we used to march, we used to march from houses to, uh, for meals. We always march there. I don't think it was compulsory, but most of us, I joined and I thoroughly enjoyed it. We had, uh, I had two good summer cruises. And we used to go off for two or three weeks in the Prince Rupert. 
the, 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 the bird, the sailing bird, uh, which used to be called the Peter. But no, no, that was great fun. The Royal Navy found as an abandoned schooner mm -hmm. of the Kaiser Wilhelm from way back. There were pictures in the, in the boardroom on, on board when it was a Bermuda ocean yacht doing, you know, the fast races and really? so on. It then had three masts, since long gone for firewood, I suppose. And this boat was hopelessly unbalanced then, with a 16-foot keel. So the slightest chop on the water, <laughs> and we were horribly seasick. <laughs> All the way to Rotterdam on the big cruise yes. that the time was on. Mm. One event, and that cruise I should just mention for fun, um, we were back on our legs again at a certain point. The winds had died down, I suppose. And Mike, I think it was Mike Beresford anyway, senior cadet, he jumped down the ladder instead of climbing it and didn't see that the hatch was open. So down into the bilges he went, broke a leg, hauled him out. We had a radio operator who signaled for help and that came in the shape of a, like a, a 20,000 ton cruise ship, Dutch, from the Dutch East Indies, I think, waiting to enter the locks into Holland. Came towards us, imagine, wee little boat, and this enormous thing came towards us to help us. And Commander Harrison, the skipper, great sense of humour, as he got very close, he picked up his megaphone and hailed, you may come alongside now. <laughs> Heather Moore, head girl from 1949 to 1950, has looked after this flag for 50 years. It was given to her by a sea cadet and is believed to have come from the training ship Prince Rupert. So we went up the Weser and that's where we abandoned ship and that was a great cruise. I was, must have been about uh, 17, 18 year old then. And uh, it was it was great. It was Why great. did you abandon ship? Because uh, at night one of the uh, watchmen fell asleep and we swung inshore and hit a mud bank. So this was the time that the ship actually. Well, we abandoned grounded. ship. We jumped in the mud, and in the morning we all got back on board and sorted it all out. All right, refloated. Yes, and I think the, uh, the the schoolmaster that was the captain was Harris. And he had to be taken off because he fell over and broke a rib. So not only did we abandon ship, we didn't have a captain. So the years passed until by the end of summer 1952, it was obvious that the training ship, Prince Rupert, was in a sorry state. The Royal Navy had left the town, and the facilities and finances were not there to support the expensive repairs that were needed. The Prince Rupert was used for another season, but as a floating hospital for members of the sailing club, until the ship was sold to a firm of shipbrokers and dismantled to deck level before being towed away. Well, um, let's talk a little bit about sporting activities. Now, they were important well, to all me, the way through. To me, because I was not uh, a book lad, I got a report from Duxbury that says that um, I was, I was good at sport, I enjoyed sport. I was captain of uh, the cricket, school cricket team. Uh, I believe I was the first person at school to score 100 runs in a cricket match. Um, I believe there were a number of German staff who worked in the school, right the way through in fact. Um, are there any memories? Yeah, my memories are uh, Herr Hesse. Of course, he was the uh, sportsman, very, a very good man, very kind man, Herr Hesse. And then I remember our night watchman, we called him Lofty. He used to wake us up every morning saying, Aufstehen, Jungs! Aufstehen, Jungs! Um, you didn't have a matron then? We had a matron, had like, a matron we had a matron, well? but I can't remember no. that at all. But we had a chap called Toshman, who looked after the Prince Rupert, the boat. Yes. He was crew. And I do remember Duxbury's housemaid. Well, a housemaid. A oh, housemaid, yes. German housemaid. Yeah, German. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah. She was called Inga Strumpf. You were the daughter of Frauenherr Hesse. 
Um, your father was a sports master at the school. Can you tell me a little bit about your father at the school? Yes. My father was sports master from uh, the first day from 1947 to 1972. From the first day till um, the school closed and moved to Renton. Right, that was a long time for about, someone. F yeah, about 25 years. 25 years, yes, mm -hmm. yes very long time. So you were at the school for five years altogether, which is quite a long time yeah, to service children. Um, to what extent did these years influence the rest of your life? Difficult well, I certainly uh, made a lot of friends at school, close friends. I think what people don't realise that we at the school didn't have a hometown like people in England, you know, from the age of 13 to 18, uh, or a local pub or whatever. So I think the school became my hometown. John, um, when you were at the school, did the church play an important part in, in your life there? Well, church was supposed to be voluntary. Uh, I always remember that at morning assembly, uh, the Roman Catholics used to fall out when we started prayers and one of the seniors used to hold a, uh, uh, an impromptu service for the Roman Catholics outside, which you occasionally bumped into if you got there late for assembly. But um, although it was supposed to be voluntary, I can remember George Wright, who was the Collingwood housemaster, used to come round, open the doors of each of the dormitories and say, time for church, boys, and we were expected to go. So I thought, well, if you've got to go, you might as well join the choir, uh, because there were perks being in the choir, you got the occasional outing and uh, various trips to various places. Um, Quite a privilege then to be choir member. Uh, well, I, I don't know uh, whether it was a great privilege, but I know we did have to go, we had a choir outing to Hamburg on one occasion because Charles Passon, who had a very fine voice till his voice broke, um, had, uh, had to sing a, a solo uh, recorded for, for BFA. Really? One thing that we used to do, I remember Stan Sackett, who was the choir master and the, the music master, probably the most popular master in the school at the time. Uh, he had one of the early, I think it was a Ford Poplar, or Popular, or Ford Anglia, one of the very, very old ones. And he used to fill the car up with, with the boys and take us out towards Yeva for a cream tea and on the way uh, we used to actually get to drive the car right uh, no it was it was great fun uh, he was uh, a great fellow and I, I can remember in fact um, every so often he and uh, Professor Schmidt from Oldenburg School of Music or Academy mm -hmm. Uh, he was great friends with him and they used to give the occasional concert in Churchill. They'd push two grand pianos together. Uh, I could always remember him playing Jamaican rumba really? uh, on the piano. And uh, Mr. Fletcher, who was uh, also a housemaster, uh, used to always sing the Tit Willow song. This is the biggest force we've had back in Germany. Our service this morning comes from the Kenneth Rupert School of Wilhelm Patton and conducted by the Reverend D.D. Watson High. Our service this
short time at Prince Rupert School, you've enjoyed singing, and you like him singing, and you can remember, <laughs> I, I'm sure, like most of us can, some of the more popular things. Well, hymns. funnily enough, I get funny looks, unfortunately, nowadays at funerals. You know, I'm 65 now, and uh, people I know nowadays from various walks of life uh, start dying off and you go to funerals and well, I'm one of the few people who can sing the hymns without the hymn book. Hello everybody, this is Stan Sackett speaking to you from Jersey. I am indeed very sorry not to be with you for this rather special reunion, but I do hope you're all having a lovely time meeting old friends and recalling some nostalgic memories of what must be to all of us a happy and unforgettable period in our lives. Doing this tape for you makes me feel as if I'm contributing to a This Is Your Life program. Better put the skeletons back in the cupboard. Well, here I am, sitting at my piano in Apple Tree Cottage. And so, before I end this tape, I thought I would play for you a few little pieces which I hope will bring back memories of Willemshaven. I'll begin with a tune which will remind you of those annual speech days when the female fraternity would delight us with their staggering display of headgear and the rafters of Churchill House would resound with this music. <laughs> the old school song Glad Hearts Adventuring. Remember it? Unfortunately I've lost my copy of the music and I was playing it from memory. I think I managed to remember it fairly well seeing that I haven't played it or seen the music for 35 years. John, it's 50 years since you left Prince Rupert's school. On reflection, do you know why it is that the school had such a profound effect on you? Well, in those days, I suppose, I can only speak for people who were there in the early days, um, and obviously for myself, uh, we lived in a fairly hostile environment. Uh, the Germans still hadn't recovered from the war, uh, and we appeared to have plenty, uh, although at the school we were all sort of locked in, we were all in the same boat. Um, Military people are basically ships that pass in the night. So some people were there for a term, you got to know them, and then suddenly they didn't come back the next term because their father had been posted. Uh, but on the other hand, you've got some people who, who spent their entire school years from starting at 11 right the way through to A-level. People who were in the forces and had any connection, especially just after the war, um, you had a, a bond, you were away from home, but you weren't homesick because that was the way things were. Uh, you either went to the boarding schools in Germany or for your secondary education you had to come home to, to England. Uh, so you were thrown together and in my day we weren't allowed out, we didn't even have dyke walks at the time. Really? If you went out, uh, we used to use an old gymnasium in the town and the sports bands, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. You got on the bus in the school, uh, uh, you went out through the gate, you got off at the gymnasium or the sports plats, you got back on the bus and you went back to school. Uh, when you arrived, we arrived in the sidings which used to be right behind the school and I will always remember the, the bell of the shunting trains used to ring a bell and in the winter you'd be playing in the corridor of your house possibly and uh, in the dark you'd hear this bell as they were shunting uh, these little steam trains with their searchlight on the back and it's a uh, whenever I hear a, 
a light bell tolling. It always takes me back to Villa Tower. And early mornings as well. Early mornings, early mornings. Early mornings. Those noises, yes. Well, we used to have, actually, I, I, I've reminded a few people in Collingwood, our night watchman uh, had lost his hand in the war. We called him Tin Hand Charlie. But he used it to good effect by rapping on the door in the morning. Oh. It's a white, he yeah. used to say. <laughs> Come on, get it. Jack, I understand you were quite keen on sport. Any particular sport? Um, yes, football was my favourite, for sure. Um, I managed to do quite well all the way through school at that. Um, I also got to like athletics, especially as a junior. Especially after training one day, I saw young Bobby Dillon running on the track. <laughs> and so I started to pace her a little bit. Oh. And, uh, so keep uh, keep track, yeah. so to speak. Does that mean you were um, keen on athletics yourself, yes, Bobby? Yes, yes. It yeah. seemed to come easy to me. Mm. I suppose um, anything to do with high jump, long jump, right. running, relays. Bobby, we've heard that um, Jack enjoyed his time in the Sea Cadets. Was there an equivalent for the young ladies of the school? Yes, we had yeah. guides, mm -hmm. and then I became an arranger. And we decided, as the air base was nearby, become air rangers, hoping that they'd take us up, which we never did. But we always hoped they would. <laughs> All right. So that went on. Yes, did, did you go camping? Yes, I did. We went camping with the guides, in fact. That was quite fun. This was at Yeva. Yes, it was, yes. Well, Jack and Bobby, um, apart from bringing you together, why do you consider that PRS was such a pe special place? It was special because we have so many good friends that we made at school that we still have. Unfortunately, some of them won't come to the reunions we hold, but we still see them and they come and stay and we stay with them. And people are so important friends mm. makes life go on, yes. turn around, and we're so happy about that, aren't we? Well, it's, uh, it, it really springs from the first day, I, I told you, entering a school with um, barbed wire and guards at the gate. We were a community to ourselves, and thank goodness it was co-ed, I mean, it would have been we became murder otherwise, so social life, sports life, you know, we all became very right. close to each other. There was only about 350 of us. A ration card. Yeah. This is probably... Nappy trading card. <laughs> this is probably even funnier. Boys clothing list. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but this was yours, was it? Precision of my list. Sure. I can't say that. Short and white. 16, 16 handkerchiefs. Yes. I don't remember having one handkerchief. Four suits. Of course, yes. yes. I don't believe it. One uh, blazer and two oh, yes. trousers. <laughs> nine shirts. And nine shirts and eleven collars, it says over here. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I do not remember having separate collars. Must have been. Oh, oh, well. See, sometimes you wore two collars. <laughs> we just, as far as I remember, had one navy blue skirt, one mm. navy blue blazer, and several white blouses, and an, either a junior or a senior tie, long socks or short socks in the summer. And a very Gabardine and raincoat? No. no. Well, I had a I had a coat which mother, all mother could get with a sort of velvet collar. Never had a raincoat and never had an umbrella. I could just never ever at the time we were really? in school. You're not did you have an umbrella? No, not an umbrella. We didn't have an umbrella. No. None of us did, as far as I remember. Yeah. But I'm sure everybody remembers the dyke walks, compulsory dyke oh, walks. Oh, yes. Freezing yes. cold. <laughs> freezing and the though, shrimp yeah. and the shrimp being cooked. Oh, oh really? Herrings like yeah. 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 especially, yes. yes. Uh, and shrimps. Yeah. Well, well, who quite caught clear. those then? By the, well, the German fishermen. German fishermen. Oh, I see. Uh, they, had the, they had their the little um, uh, huts and mm. uh, pots, you know, casks, mm. in which they um, uh, steamed and cured, cured the fish. And you'd go along and they gave you a bit of like bread, it. ten fennies. <laughs> really? Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful yeah. fish. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Without the school transport system, much of the daily running of Prince Rupert's school would not have been possible. Walter Fleischauer, the son of Billy, one of the drivers, has given us the following items.
Now we've done much together, you and I. Together we founded this school and we've watched it grow from very shaky childhood to something that's vigorous and very much alive. So we've had our disappointments, we've had our failures, and we've had our difficult times. But we've had two of our successes, and I think we can say we've had a very happy time together, and we're all proud of our school and rightly so. We're proud of its achievements, we're proud of its successes, its flourishing state. In fact, we're proud of its life. In June 1950, the Royal Navy finally left their base at the Bonterheim, and this site was taken over by the school. In May, 25 girls took up residence in a new junior house called Grenville. Also on the Bonterheim site were sailing and meeting facilities for the Sea Cadet Force, and a large accommodation facility where 90 parents were able to stay three times a term for easy weekends. In September 1950, Grenville House moved from the Bonterheim and opened on the Fliegerdijk, along with a new house called Rally, and these houses accommodated junior boys and girls. My parents had arranged, this is in 1948 of course, had arranged during either the first term or the second term in 48 to go back to England on leave, and I wanted to go with them. Now, I went to see Smither, <coughs> who uh, had me in his office, and he said, um, yes, yes, no, I'm sorry, but I can't, I won't sanction that. Your education is far more important. So I said, well, I, I really do want to go, sir. Well, he said, if you, leave, if you go, he said, you don't come back. So I went, why didn't go back? 